This is EntreEd Talk, the podcast for entrepreneurial educators by entrepreneurial educators. We are your hosts, Toy Hirschman and Amber Ravenscroft. This podcast is created by the National Consortium for Entrepreneurship Education, or EntreEd for short. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting episode of EntreEd Talk. We are thrilled to be here today with Rick Terrian. He is a lifelong entrepreneur and innovator who truly exemplifies the idea behind his published book, Ageless Startup, Start a Business at Any Age. Rick is a previous recipient of the U.S. Small Business New Product of the Year by the National Society of Professional Engineers, has been recognized by Fast Company as one of their Fast 50, and was recognized as a Purpose Prize Fellow in 2015 from AARP. Rick has nine U.S. and foreign patents and is a recognized leader in regional food systems, helping launch and lead one of the most innovative regional food organizations in the world. We are so excited to have Rick here with us today to share his ageless story and entrepreneurship. So welcome, Rick. Hi, thank you. I'm so pumped. We did actually a recent interview around food systems too, so it's fascinating (laughs) that we're, we're kind of having circular episodes, but there's so much beyond that that we have to talk about. But we like to kick things off with, how did you get to where you are today question. So we'll dive into some of the big accomplishments a bit later, but I was wondering if you could talk about Young Rick, you mentioned in your bio selling newspapers at stoplights. Um, so growing up, how did entrepreneurship exemplify itself in you? Right. I don't think parents would let their kids be selling uh, <laughs> newspapers at busy intersections in the, during drive time in Chicago. Uh, Probably not. But it's what we all did. It, it, was, uh, it was the 1950s. Every, I grew up thinking that everyone needed to make a contribution to their families and their communities, and you, you just needed to find stuff to do to contribute. And they wouldn't let uh, kids at the time have regular jobs, but this was an opening that uh, it was some sort of an artifact from a previous time, and we could still do it. So it was really fun, and it was a, a real learning experience as well. Both of my grandparents were entrepreneurs. My dad was an entrepreneur. It didn't have the cachet that it does now. It wasn't a cool thing to do. It's just what you did. It's it's how you helped raise the tide around you. So it was doing that and 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 the selling of the newspapers. That there was different techniques to use to get somebody to put their hand out from a car window, a quarter of a mile down. You have to run through the exhaust to get to it, but you learned how to sell something and. I've carried that mantra with me ever since is that nothing happens till somebody sells something. Wow. Um, in your, in your bio, Rick, you talked about, you talk about your, the food sector and can you tell us how you got into that and, and how that's, I I guess that's the most recent thing you're doing because you have a lot of other things that happened before then. My most of my life, I had worked as a manufacturer. I was making things, and and companies were producing product. Um, during the last recession, uh, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, I took a sabbatical and was doing economic development work in a regional county in rural Wisconsin, and um, came across an opportunity. It was a center for supporting people with disabilities that had a small commercial kitchen. It was actually a Dairy Queen that they had uh, put together for jobs for people with disabilities and community to meet the folks in their care. Um, It was a really wonderful setup for a long time, but the highway had bypassed their little town and this place had gone out of business and they were turning it into a commercial kitchen. And I was the new economic developer in the region and thought, well, what could be hard about this? At the time it was, a lot of people were starting to talk about local foods. It was at the beginning of that wave and seemed like a natural. Um, it was among the most naive things I've ever been <laughs> led <laughs> myself into. Food is a profoundly difficult and uh, in many ways dangerous enterprise. Uh, food can kill people. It can hurt people. You have to do it absolutely right and taking shortcuts is no way to do that and so what I found is that um, if there was a missing manufacturing step my background in manufacturing helped me recognize that we needed to be able to produce food safely and at smaller scale than what had been done over the previous uh, 
several decades. The American food system has been industrialized in many ways and made bigger and more national and we lost the capacity to produce more regional products. And so I've turned my attention to that for the last decade or so. Uh, and I helped that wonderful small kitchen in Wisconsin make the switch uh, from something that was just supporting a few folks to turn it into a commercial kitchen and a contract food manufacturer. It made all kinds of jobs for people with disabilities. It was the most fun I ever had at work. Uh, it was the best peer group I ever had. And together we made, and at my direction, we made most of the mistakes you could possibly make <laughs> around uh, producing food and, and, and turning yourself into a commercial food product manufacturer. Uh, but we did it. And it was a really solid little model. Um, there are many competing models to this, many that require continuous inputs of public funds, um, nonprofit type kitchens. Um, these are perfectly good and they're wonderful public policy, but boy, if you lose that public funding, um, where do these go? So I've been working on, a mo on models to make them sustainable and repeatable. And if there is any public funds in the beginning only, uh, but you make these facilities, true manufacturing facilities, where there's a lot of science, there's a lot of art. Um, and I believe this region that we're in, that we're talking about this, especially this Appalachian region is um, potentially a center for this contract food manufacturing for North America. We've got the energy, we've got the uh, markets right nearby. I'm, I'm very excited about it. So I've come to Pittsburgh to try to build a foundry system for small scale contract food manufacturing, among other things. And, and I think that that's going to serve the region significantly in the long run. Very cool. You made me cackle a little bit. I'm obsessed with watching shows like Restaurant Impossible and Kitchen Nightmares. And you never realize how difficult food is. And oftentimes when they ask those owners, like, why did you get into this? They're like, oh, it would have been fun. So it made me laugh a little bit when you said like food is one of the hardest things to get into because people truly don't understand the complexities of it. I was wondering if you could dive into, I, I know what Kristen Dunn, thank you for connecting us, had mentioned that you had supported a jam business in Wisconsin. I was wondering if you could just provide a quick, up, up. I'm fascinated by that. Um, so I was wondering if you could go over that a little bit. Well, sure. And, and jams um, and also barbecue sauces, things like that are usually the entry level point mm -hmm. where somebody really has a, either a great source of the product itself, a specialty heirloom product that they want to do, or it's a recipe uh, that's been handed down over the years and is, um, I find their best when they're regional or locally identifiable. That's where the it's hard to break into a national food business, but it's it's much easier to identify with a local, a locality, or a region. I've had uh, dozens of these kinds of small companies come and knock on the door, and jam companies and barbecue sauce companies, and the, it's a real joy to help when they have the capacity to fight through this because it's not an easy path. It's a real joy to see them succeed. And people can do this at a smaller scale. Uh, the entrepreneurship question, which is we're talking about entrepreneurship, is what do you do with companies like this? And this is where it gets a little um, non-traditional in what I tell people is going to be available to them. It's the, the day and age of becoming a mega brand in food is probably... Um, it's not over, but for people to get through it is, is, and into the national level is, um, it's, it's a different game. It's, it's not all romance. Like you were talking about with the, with the restaurants is people think, oh, it's just great. And people will buy it and we'll rack up the sales right now. There's a great, great opportunity out there for people to take those small jam companies and barbecue sauce companies and get them up to a certain amount of revenue and then sell them and then go back and do it again and again and again and again. The big companies don't have the staff any longer. They don't have the institutional know-how, the brains to develop new products. They will all tell you that. 
And what the, there's a feeding frenzy in the market right now of larger food companies out buying anything that they can that's new and novel. Mm -hmm. um, so for those of us at the bottom of that food chain, uh, this is a really great opportunity to, once you learn how to do this and you learn how to handle food safely and you learn about packaging and distribution, you can go back and do this over and over and over and just keep selling companies. That's a really interesting way to approach entrepreneurship in the 21st century, I think. Um, yeah, that's, that's very, that's what you hear a lot of in terms of app development and things like that, but it's the same kind of idea, right? And I, I love, I love that you, uh, we talk to teachers and students all the time about finding opportunities right. and instead of problems. We don't like that word, that P word. Um, but you are, uh, you, you had identified a major gap in that whole chain where you have these small farmers or people that are making these, you know, small batches of, of really great stuff, but there's no way for them. They don't have that manufacturing know-how. They don't have that clean kitchen. They don't have those things. And so I think that it's really neat how you identified that and were able to make that happen with, with the food system. And in Wisconsin, that now they have that, now they have this innovation kitchen and they can do these, these amazing things and small farmers now have access to that. So I think that's a, 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 big, a big win and a, a big win for, for the little guy too, so. Yeah, I think about our, I mean, Toy, I know that you've, you've seen this too. A lot of our schools, Rick, just for your knowledge, that some of their first steps are farmer's markets and teaching the students about how to make locally sourced salsa. And I think that what you just said and iterated was there is a, you know, a growing need for some of those small batch places to create new things for, I mean, I just think that most educators that are listening have thought that might have been the limit of where we could have taken that. And you just presented an entirely new opportunity for them. Well, and I think it's one we can build across this entire region. Uh, yeah. the, the North America needs a new foundry system for small food brands. And, you know, I'm going to use Pittsburgh because that's where I am right now. But that food safety and branding was invented in Pittsburgh. This was a food town as, as much as a steel town. Uh, steel took it over eventually, but this this region for food has uh, a market of tens and tens and tens of millions of people right around it. We could be a breadbasket for novel foods if we can get the production system in place, and and that's what I'm banging my head against on my day job. <laughs> Very cool, though. Very cool. So, so Rick, we we have some conversations in schools around um, intellectual property because a lot of kids, oh, I'm just going to start this business, and then sometimes they have these great things and they don't even have that discussion. Um, so that's a that's a big one for us. So, can you talk? I and mean, you have a lot of different patents. Can you talk a little bit about that and what it's like to go through that process? Because I know it's it's difficult and a little bit daunting to people when they think about it. Sure. Well, and I, I think the young people now have a, a, an especially good opportunity to think about intellectual property in that there's so many ways to publish yourself now. Mm -hmm. um, and when you are the first one to publish ideas or words, that's and it's first time it's in public use, that's your copyright. You, you are in the intellectual property system when you begin to do that and you can treat those as assets, even though they may not be assets you can hold in your hand, like a hammer or, or money, um, uh, intellectual property is an asset to your company and you can build those for free in the copyright system. There's a trademark system that should be considered um, and it's inexpensive. It does give you an exclusive right to use a name or a brand or a product description. Um, and I'm, I'm a, a great advocate of that, especially for brand new businesses. Um, they, it's, the, it's hard to develop assets around when you're building something from nothing. That's what entrepreneurs do. They build something from nothing. And intellectual property is a, is a strong piece of that. Patents are... Um, a, a different kettle of fish. Um, I enjoyed going after them. I really like the invention pro process. My dad was a patented inventor. Um, my uncles were uh, patented inventors. 
I really liked it for the recognition it gave to me and my small team that built these uh, innovations. In the 21st century, it's an expensive process to go through. I, if you guys won't mind, I'm going to recommend some books to go yeah. through this okay. process. Please. Um, but I will say that the, the, the upside of patents is that they are a really good asset for any small company. The downside of it is that um, they're really expensive to maintain and, mm -hmm. and protect. If some big company wants to come after, and it's the three of us have the Amber and Toy and Rick Club, and we're, we've got a, a, a patent to defend. Some big company wants to steal it. It's going to be probably hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend that in court. So again, I go, I circle back to this idea of entrepreneurship in the 21st century. You want to build up as many assets as you can, including intellectual property assets. And that can be patents, but um, especially trademarks and copyright. Mm -hmm. And then sell it and go back and do it again. This is an absolute skill set that's needed in the 21st century. And those of us thinking about entrepreneurship, um, we can practice it and at, at, at all levels, uh, including the, our youngest people uh, our educators are working with. I will say that the, in case anyone needs a reference for these intellectual property books, I found a, a great company publishing legal help books in California called NOLO, N-O-L-O, -O, NOLO Press. And they've got books on trademarks and copyright and patents and all of it. And I would recommend those books to anybody. It's clear and simple to follow. And I think educators could use them in their classrooms as well. It's, it's that accessible. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great resource to share. I think you brought up an interesting point that even if educators talked about publication and as soon as something is published and out there and you're first with that, that you are copyrighted, I think that's a huge perk for teachers to even start talking in that manner and to understand, have students understand that even that is copyrighted and get them to be comfortable with the process. Troy, I know we talk about this all the time. Like they have such good ideas. And I think as soon as that, those ideas start coming to life and are put into any kind of like process, they, we need to be talking simultaneously about this. So, yeah, no, I appreciate the, the resource there because we wanted to highlight your existing work in that space and all the, all the patents that you've already worked on and all the copyright and intellectual property value that you bring to this conversation. So as part of that, I'm assuming, and I don't, I don't know exactly the, the, if this is the correct assumption, you've been recognized as a part of Fast 50. Is that for your work in the manufacturing realm? That was, and, and it came about of, with the patents that uh, we were awarded for that work. Um, and yes, it, that was, and it's now called, it's from Fast Company Magazine. It's now called the world's 50 most innovative companies. It was called the Fast 50. And I think we were, and this is where I, it speaks to uh, the folks we're talking to on this podcast. I think that we did that when we were awarded that, we were the smallest company ever to win that award. We did it with- four people and it was usually, you know, the, the giants. And I, I, I like that part of standing up for the smallest of businesses and uh, saying that you can compete and, and we did. And uh, so, yeah, that was the Fast 50 from Fast Company Magazine. So are you gonna leave us in suspense and not tell us what it is that you did? <laughs> no, like, like, what is it? Is <laughs> are you talking about the patents then? Yeah. The, yeah, yes. the innovative company. What is the innovative company? So you ask now, <laughs> you'll have to pull the kill button because I'm going to be talking about this. I got right a now. whole, I got a whole ream of paper right here, Rick. <laughs> let, him, let me have it. <laughs> so I was working in uh, a field that I learned something here. This is an angle for younger people as well. I learned something to do when I was a kid with my dad. And my dad was an inventor and he worked in water treatment. And I had to do the dumb guy stuff. This was like 11 and 12, 13 years old in factories, which they don't let 11 year olds into factories very often anymore. But I had learned how to do a, the dumb guy stuff to keep dad's smart guy stuff working. And it was a, basically a water filtration and you know getting out the easy stuff so that dad's really smart equipment could 
really hammer home a, a, a cleanliness factor that that industry would need. I grew up, I had another business I ran for, raised my kids, ran for 25 years. Um, I saw the industry changing. Um, I sold that business and took a sabbatical. And I, during that sabbatical, I tried to resurrect what I had learned with my dad. And um, so I took it to some friends of mine who happened to work at Harley Davidson Manufacturing, the motorcycle manufacturer in Milwaukee. And I told them, I said, I know you've got this stupid problem inside your factory there because I can see all the smoke coming out your smokestacks. Um, I know how to fix that. And they let me in. And I made, again, almost every mistake you could possibly make. Uh, but we got it figured out at Harley Davidson and almost every motorcycle that not almost every motorcycle that Harley Davidson has built since 1998 has, has gone through our equipment. Um, so try to answer your question. It uh, cleaned up fluids, manufacturing fluids inside these factories so that they wouldn't have to get dumped out the back door or Harley Davidson wouldn't do that, but wouldn't have to re-enter the environment in some other pathway. And at the same time, it prevented a secondary problem of oil and carbon getting burned in these manufacturing plants. And then the carbon would flow up the smokestacks and out into the environment. So I think those, when I left about 10 years ago, we were recycling about 10 million gallons of industrial fluids every year that used to get lost as wastewater. Wow. And, so uh, and now it's well over that. Well, that's probably double that now. And, it, and an untold amount of carbon from going up the smokestacks and into the atmosphere. But we, we had customers, there was four of us in the company and we had customers in Africa and China and all over Asia and Europe um, it was, it was on six continents. It was really fun. It was, it was, and we were doing an awful lot of good at, at the time. And that's why we got this recognition. Wow. So you have some supersonic, like centrifuge technology. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> I used to be an engineer before. So like, uh -huh. I know Toy was an engineer. <laughs> Be careful, Toy. I'm going to keep telling you about this stuff. Uh, oh, I did. <laughs> it, it was really fun. And as you know, the highest distinction you can get a recognition as an engineer is a professional engineer, a PE. And so we got our new product of the year award from the National Society of Professional Engineers. It's the highest engineering certification in the world. Yeah, so, that's amazing. There was small companies using our equipment. And by the end, the space craft companies, Pratt and Whitney and Boeing were using our equipment because uh, it was the best product to use. So now I've got spacecraft floating around as well as all those uh, Harley Davidson's going past me. Oh, I thought that he was just casually not going to cover this at all. <laughs> but, but I think, I mean, your message about, you know, this came from a skill you learned when you were young with your, your father and right. being exposed to it is so important. And I want to dive into what you're currently, your published work is about, because we had talked it before the, we started recording around this idea of ageless startup. You're obviously targeting an older generation and we work with younger kids, but that message is timeless. So I was wondering if you could talk about your book, the message that you're trying to advocate with that. And I pulled this from the website. It's not hard, it's just new. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit and then I'm sure we'll dive in with our insights as well. Uh, well, good. Um, that is, that's, that's a phrase that the publisher pulled out of the book itself. Uh, I had written it, but I hadn't moved it to the front, and they identified it as Entrepreneur Press, um, and they said, look, for any audience you're talking to, the thing you want to make sure everybody knows is this isn't that hard. I mean, it was a nice way, I think, of them pointing at me and saying, look at you, you figured it out. Uh, anybody, <laughs> anybody ought to be able to do this if you can. Um, and I've been doing it my whole life. Uh, I, I want people to know that it is it, it really isn't hard, but it is new. And there's a lot of people who mix those two up. Doing new things is not something maybe people just gravitate to. A lot of, a lot of us do. You have to separate it from it being hard. It, the, yes, there's new things to learn. There's new skills to learn. There's new people to meet. 
that that's all new and it's you know if you're more comfortable watching television then that maybe this isn't for you but on the other hand if you aren't afraid of learning something new this isn't that hard it's not like you know putting a roof on in august it's just something that anybody can do men or women at any age and young people and old people and where i am specifically want to see this go is young people and old people together. I think this is a profoundly important time and opportunity for doing intergenerational entrepreneurship. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited about that prospect and I, and I get that into the book as much as I can. And, and when I'm talking to people about that is, and it's not just one directional where, you know, older people are gonna be able to speak from on high uh, I think that young people can mentor older people and, and be just as effective as vice versa here. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I think we're entering a, a new age of re- entrepreneurship. It's going to be a renaissance age. And I think the generation in the middle, people raising families, that's tough. But younger people and older people together uh, that have that crazy mix of enthusiasm and, uh, and know-how, uh, and attitude. Uh, it's, a, it's a great mix and I would love to see more of it together. Hi all, we are super excited to offer an exclusive discount for our listeners to attend this year's EntreEd Forum taking place on November 18th and 19th in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We have an incredible lineup of speakers and experiential learning opportunities to help you ignite entrepreneurial thinking and integrate entrepreneurship into your learning communities. Use promo code EntreEdTalk to receive 5% off of every individual registration. Again, that's promo code EntreEdTalk. To learn more about the forum and register, visit www.entre-ed.org today and subscribe for updates as we launch new things happening every week as part of the planning for the forum. Thanks. See you there. Everybody always throws me into the middle. <laughs> What's it all about, Amber? <laughs> <laughs> Probably because you have Carl and the little ones. We had we had a, another podcast where it was talking about millennials and boomers, and I was like, what about me? Right. <laughs> I've got skills. <laughs> so you should be lining them up and getting them ready. It takes longer than you think. I can work with my kids when I'm older. <laughs> yes. Perfect. They're much smarter than I am, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. That's so, that's so interesting. And I, um, I did a little snooping around on your book. I think I'm going to get it. I wish there, is there an audio version? Cause that's how I read these days. I read those days too, too with audio and no, there isn't one yet, but the, I, I did talk to the publisher about it and I do know about these things. I think it might get there. I hope it does. That would be awesome, but I'll probably read it. I'll probably read it the old fashioned way. Um, but I, I looked at one of the things that stuck out when I was looking at it was this idea from transitioning. And I, we have teachers actually that are in this category in some ways, um, but transitioning from what you're currently doing easily into an entrepreneurial adventure, even if that doesn't mean leaving your job, because we do, we have teachers that end up writing books and doing all kinds of interesting things and keep their job. Um, you know, we have a friend who now has blog podcast, all this stuff. So I wondered if you could speak a little bit to that, that idea of being an entrepreneur and that transition. No, I would love to. And that's the source of entrepreneurship for almost everybody. It's not like there's very few of us that have done this our whole lives. We're all coming out of different circumstances. And we've learned many things during those previous years that we can apply to entrepreneurship. I think teachers are just the exact perfect model for somebody transitioning into entrepreneurship um, based on their ability to speak and learn new things and enter new worlds and meet new people. What I do say in the book is that all of this takes longer than you think. And, and that isn't even a bad thing. I'm telling, I tell people to start slow. You know, if you have a job, if you are a teacher, if you've got some kind of a, a, a job you're currently doing, um, stay with that, but get your next act in place. It will take longer than you think. Nothing is quick in this world. And getting cash flow and customers and all of that in place just takes time. And you know, you can read about 
young superstar Silicon Valley types that, you know, so you've got 20 year old billionaires. I get it. That's a perfectly good part of our economy. There's, I'm not, I'm not knocking that, but there's all the, for tens of thousands of years, we've all been starting small, tiny businesses to help ourselves and help our communities and make ourselves more resilient and more valuable to the communities we live in. That's the kind of enterprise that I'm talking about here. And I think teachers are in a perfect position to take the skills they have and morph that into a, a, a new and different kind of a career that uh, makes them more resilient and makes their own communities more resilient. That's so true. I, I would, uh, we had a podcast with a, a school and one of the teachers in the middle, kind of like you with your amazing <laughs> invention and you're in the, in the middle of the podcast, like, oh yeah, well, I had run this entire cosmetics line, you know, and, and we were interviewing her as she had kids on the, on the interview, uh, her own students. And they were talking about this, how entrepreneurial their school is and what they're doing. But because of that exposure herself, Coming in as a teacher, she started this whole thing that's now informing her classes and her kids. It's really, it's really cool how that how that works and completely different. Like this is like a math teacher doing that, like a completely different skill set, completely different world. So I just thought that was a neat, very neat cool. Press. Right. Can you can you talk a little bit about? I think Toy. I'm sure you also have seen this multiple times this idea that now it's it's difficult for students to fail right now like there's a lot of advocacy around failing forward and you know how to get students comfortable with that and one of the topics you listed that you cover in your book is tackling obst obstacles with an open mind i was wondering if you could talk a little bit don't have to give us the whole chapter obviously but how you frame that conversation and what advice would you give to educators that are struggling to get their students comfortable with that Sure, and, and I, I think there's a flavor of failure that we don't give enough credit to, and that's sort of a, people run from it as, a, as a something of an uncomfortable place to be at, but it's uncertainty. Uh, and everyone wants to be certain about everything all the time, when in fact, this idea of uncertainty and looking for a better way um, and being able and not knowing if the path that you're taking is going to succeed in that, um, you come out with better outcomes. So I'm a, a, obviously I'm well skilled at failure and, and, and things not working out right. But the fact of the matter is what drove all of that is uncertainty on why something couldn't be better and why wouldn't something work and why wasn't that really great idea I had for fixing that thing broken today. Uh, uh, it, it, it leads to more questions. So I think if you brand it as failure, um, you know, that's a, people think, well, that's something I've got on my resume. I, was, I, 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 was, I, I failed at something. Well, no, you just figured out what didn't work. Um, there's nothing magical about that. And you're uncertain about what might work. So what do we do next? And how do we carry this conversation? And what other people could I talk to and in, involve in a network that might fix this? Um, I, I celebrate that uncertainty. It drives my friends crazy, but I, I really like it. I think that's a good bumper sticker there, Rick. <laughs> What's your flavor of failure? <laughs> <laughs> or a t-shirt, either way. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's something that is very hard to, to get through, especially with, with students as they go kind of up the chain academically. It gets, that box gets smaller and smaller and tighter and tighter. And you get kind of some anxious kids sometimes coming out going, if I don't know the answer, it's over for me. Right. And that's where we're, we're kind of trying to reverse engineer that and, and take them back to the kindergarten mentality. That's pretty much our mission. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. Well, the, oppor the opportunity to think and look at something differently and not be certain of an outcome is, is a, a wonderful gift to give yourself and give to especially young people. Um, that's, how, that's how this planet's going to evolve into a better place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a really, 
that's like the best closing line ever. So I, <laughs> I think, I think we, we're, we're come, kind of coming up on time. But so before we wrap up, can you tell us and our audience how people can connect with you to learn more about your book, about what you're doing, about your super, super covert um, chemistry <laughs> or anything else that they're curious about? Sure, sure. Well, so the book is called Ageless Startup, and it's coming out from Entrepreneur Press, uh, and it'll be available April 21st of this year, 2020. Um, there is a, you can search Amazon for it or Barnes and Noble. Uh, I have a website for it that is ageless-startup.com, ageless-startup.com. And there's a, a form on there for signing up for email newsletters or to ask questions of. I've also got a Facebook page up uh, for it, specifically for the book, which is also ageless-startup at Facebook. Um, that one is not as well populated as I've been, as the website is, but I'm uh, doing both uh, as fast as I can pedal. Uh, it's coming along very nicely. Uh, it, Entrepreneur Magazine just had a full page ad for the book that I was, uh, I, a friend oh. sent, me, sent me a picture. My copy isn't here yet, but uh, I was able to post that to Facebook last night. It was, it's a beautiful ad. Oh, that's so exciting. It's exciting. Awesome. Well, we just really appreciate you to being on here today and your time and just enlightening us so much. I think that our audience is really going to appreciate this and I'm sure people will be looking forward to that book. I'm now mad. I can't get it until April 21st. So. <laughs> I'm going to have to sign up for the pre. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a pre-order button. Right, right, right. Awesome. Uh, well, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk about this and especially this intergenerational opportunity between younger people and older people across this region that we're focused on. I think that um, there's so many skills and so many opportunities that uh, are, are available to be knit back together that have been pulled apart by a pretty coarse economy lately. Um, I think that we can do these to help our own communities and, and grow them from the inside out. I agree. That's fantastic. Oh, well, thank you so much. And we appreciate you and hope to meet you again on our travels and your travels. That would be epic. I would love that. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, folks.